So. <laughs> <laughs> What's going on? I don't know. It just <laughs> felt like an autistic moment. Um, we have today uh, a show. <laughs> Let's with, start there. With Alex Fredericks. <laughs> and we're going to talk about smokable hemp on A, a Wonderful, Wonderful Chaos. Chaos. Hey, Bambos. Hey, Andy. <laughs> <sighs> How are you today? Uh, peaceful. Yeah? Yeah. What's, what's going on or what's shifted inside of you in the, mm. since I saw you last? Uh, journaling. Like every time today I got stuck, I would go and write. Uh-huh. And... The, the writing started with questions, figuring out what the right question, and then giving myself an abundant amount of answers mm. to uh, play with. So using the journaling as a way to move through stuckness. Mm. Or Beautiful. a moment of procrastination, like I didn't want to take an action on something. It's like, oh, then w w let's, let's write about this and then figure out why is procrastination there. Mm. <sighs> That's come up a lot on the show, right? With people who have spoken about their practices. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. And you? Uh, I've, I've been um, reading the audio book. I got to chapter 30. You said we're not going to talk about that I know, today. but I realized <laughs> there was something about it that was special in it that actually changed my mind at the last minute. Okay. And it was the, right before I came here, I read the letter that Holly Butcher wrote. She was a 26-year-old from, I believe it was Australia or New Zealand. And I included part of her letter in the book. And it was the letter that she wrote to call it humanity before she died. Basically, wow. the, the, just this letter to say, guys, uh, what are you doing and why are you wasting your time with nonsense? And so um, I read the letter and then I was listening to it back and editing it. And I just began to cry because I heard the word, her words through my, my, um, reading of it and it was so uh it was so spot on with just the urgency of not getting lost in minutia not getting stuck in whatever you think is important because when you're facing death and you're looking at this is what i have like everything is beautiful mm -hmm. so um so i read that and uh I just, or i edited that and it was really beautiful right before i came here yeah so that was good. What, what chapter was this in? Chapter 30. I'm going to... Yeah. I'll give you the audio, because the audio, I think, might even be better than the reading of it, actually. Um, and so if we switch or progress to Alex... Alex Fredericks. I've known Alex now since the book tour. We met through a mutual friend who's kind of fed me interesting characters, and Alex is one of them. The mutual friend is Gino. He may even be watching. And Alex was really cool because, you know, when you, when you take on a project, you do any project, you, you know, you really appreciate when somebody does something for you where they don't have to do anything for you, but he just did it to support without asking anything in return. And, and, and I am one of these people in life, like if someone does something for me without without, you know, hey, I need, I'm expecting something back, then I have a deep gratitude towards that because I see how infrequently that happens. People can be so transactional that you don't actually get a chance to sort of just appreciate that, hey, there's just people trying to do things. What can I do to help them? And um, and, and in this case, he had, you know, he's worked, he's worked in the music industry and he has a lot of connections. And, and we had uh, uh, someone that actually very much aligned with what I was doing. And um, I, I, uh, he basically created a Netflix series called uh, The Kindness Diaries. And he basically said, hey, listen, I'll support you and give you a contact and see what you can work out with him and see if maybe he can support you in some way. And that was basically with him not knowing me. Hmm. And, and I've seen how, how hard it is for people to just make these, make these uh, introductions. So after that, Alex and I just became friends. 
So I've called him up every three to four months and given him a hard time. He's given me a hard time. And when we had the show, I thought, how do I get him on? And the thing that's incredible about Alex and his mind is that he's got one of these minds that's just like pulsating. Pul You'll see when he comes on, pulsating, pulsating, pulsating. That's why he's smoking weed, I'm guessing, um, is so that he can slow down part of that pulse. <laughs> and when that pulse goes, what you see is it's waiting to see the problem that it's going to solve. It's like the joy is what's the challenge and how can we make this happen? So I've been looking at him. He's done a lot of infomercials for well-known celebrities of which we can't name because he's explained that there's discretionary signatures or things like this. But he does, like if someone says we are going to put our name on a product, he's the guy who makes these commercials and creates this sort of momentum around them. And in the last few weeks, he's been posting uh, hemp cigarettes or hemp like hemp uh, cigarettes, right? What, yeah. Well, and the joints. <laughs> joints. I don't think he called them a joint. We'll we'll have a discussion about that when he comes on. Joints. <laughs> <laughs> he started. But then I said, "Oh, cool! I found my inroads to get him on the show." And then I started. I, you know, I don't think I've had as much trouble naming a show as I had this one. This is the most trouble I've had. Why? Because the first show idea that I gave Alex is I said, "I'm a drug dealer." And he said, no, that isn't true. I'm not a drug. And he said, I, and this is the beauty of it. He says, I have no problem being called a drug dealer, but it's factually incorrect. And then he started to give me some lit litany of explanation of the difference between THC and CBD, how these things have to be distinguished in order for you to understand. So he would have even accepted that he was a drug dealer, which is, it speaks to his, mm -hmm. his, you know, his freedom to be whoever uh, I needed him to be. But that was it. He had incredible ads. I enjoyed the ads that he was creating. Very commercial, interesting, funny. Made me want to almost smoke. <laughs> and then I said, let's get him on and discuss this topic. Don't, don't let your wife watch this episode. <laughs> <laughs> and whatever else comes on, we'll discuss that as well. So Should without further on? ado, we're bringing Alex out of compliment purgatory. Hello, Alex. Hey, Alex. Pleasure, gentlemen. Um, I have to actually correct of all of the things you just said. Thank you so very much. The reason that I say that I'm not a drug dealer is because I was in the transportation business and they're different. What, what do you mean the transportation business? Well, that's a different conversation, maybe for a different day if we're speaking about how we get to where we are. But drug dealers are people that uh, engage in transactional business. I was in transportation, which meant I brought one thing to another. And we can get to there. <laughs> Maybe on a different understanding. And frankly, what I sell for a living is completely legal. So therefore, I'm not actually a drug dealer again. I know, so, that's what I learned from our interactions. Yeah. I mean, you I actually was correcting. I was just correcting the misnomer about me. What I am <laughs> is a, a rambunctious individual. So I know where the edge of that envelope is. So I, <laughs> so I can speak freely just want to say I'm not a drug dealer because I never sold anything. I was in the transportation business when I was younger, which is my understanding of why cannabis and hemp are different. So. <laughs> anything you say will be used. Cannabis will be used against you in the court of law. Right, exactly. I'm just, saying, uh, just so we understand each other clearly. I, pre I appreciate it, though. Um, what I want to say, Andy, to you, as somebody that has been introduced through third parties and typically are just like people call themselves connectors so they throw folks together without a – an understanding of why mm -hmm. all I've ever wanted to be was myself. So when I meet genuine folks, the answer is always yes. Mm. Then what's the question for me? Because for me as well. For me as I, well. I get when somebody's just asking me about the shiny object. I was very blessed in my music career um, to travel the world when I was in my 20s when it meant nothing about me. I had gotten run over by a band. They broke my heart. Somebody gave me a job to be a tour manager to say, hey, kid, you're smart. Sorry that didn't work out for you. Go go earn, right? And so it was never about me, though. I was carrying the clipboard. So you had to go through me to get to them, right? And though I did a great job for them, really, it was never about me. So therefore, I could understand and I don't mean this against anybody else, who was a genuine person standing in front of me and actually cared about how are you today versus, hey, man, how are you today? You know, where they're like looking past you and shit. So yeah. when we first met, 
And yeah, I was working with a guy named Leon Logothetis, who's very one of the very few names I might ever mention because he genuinely is a wonderful human being and the Kindness Diaries was a great project to be involved with. But when we, you and I met, I was like, oh, no, I actually get Andy. Like, that's a, that's a real dude. Like, if I was sitting at a bar or a restaurant or, you know, a sports game or on a subway line, he might be a guy that I'm just like, hey, <laughs> bah, 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 bah. yeah. So, you know, like the answer is yes. Now, what's the yeah. question? Yeah, that was the way I felt. I mean, and I, I often work the same way. Like people don't know how quickly they reveal what they're all about. Sure. And I make the decision maybe within seconds if I want to spend any more time with them just through how they actually engage. And it's- I think it, for and, any, any client I've ever worked with, I have to explain to them the most powerful word in the English language is no. I'm happy to fucking use it too. You, so guys, you guys are really touching- Oh, oh, sorry. We, we lost the sound. We got but, you yeah. back, yeah. So you guys are really touching on something. So what is the thing that you guys tune into when you have a yes to someone? Oh, for me, it's vibration. Like, honestly. Okay, so I am I have really bad eyesight. And I gave up glasses 18 months ago, other than when I drive. I see that. <laughs> other than when i drive i stopped wearing glasses and my wife thinks i'm insane which i might be but the reason is it's easier to read the person's body language and mm. i know exactly what you want from me when you're coming at me seriously the way that you're carrying yourself i'm so not a woo-woo guy i went to the university of vermont i'm not a true hugger but the way that you carry yourself and your vibe says sells way more than the lexicon that you're choosing to express your opinion in your mm -hmm. voice vocabulary it really does so when you're in the service business which is where i started in the music business and though it mattered what i do and how i do it nobody saw me man trust me and i've always looked like this you look right past me as a dude i'm happy to be that guy so when we do this Celestine prophecy thing. You know what I mean? Like we connect eyes and you have something for me. Well, then in 35 seconds, I seriously, I get your vibe because I feel it or not. Hmm. The, the trick for me, just as a human being, is that I'm not looking for anything. I'm really not. I was raised in New York City in the 80s. I know exactly what wealth and taste and class and what you can't buy and what money affords you and really interesting people have nothing to do with what's in their pocket truthfully they really don't so if you're looking to purchase something get a job earn it buy it but if you're looking to have an experience it really is about what you are and what you're offering so therefore, the way that somebody approaches me, just as a clipboard human being that's making a decision, this is decision time. Choices you have, limit the choices you, your choices you make, limit the choices you have. Great thing, less things to worry about. So when somebody approaches me, literally, I either feel you or I don't. <laughs> I, I, I could put you in a movie. Like, I love, I love yep. the way you're expressing. Yeah, it's the same. I would say exactly the same. I, I mean, even the wording you would use. I mean, if someone's trying to get you to sort of do an NLP analysis of what it is that is the characteristic, some characteristics are just so embodied in the individual that if you have a little bit more empathy, if you have the capacity to feel what's going on in you when you're with somebody else, mm -hmm. you immediately feel this just feels good or bad. And you know what the funny thing is? In my life, I've had really like strong negative reactions to people, which which I won't have all that often because there's a lot of compassion, I feel. Like if someone's suffering, I don't normally judge that suffering. But when I feel manipulation and dishonesty, like I get triggered in a way that's like, mm -hmm. okay, I just don't want to be around that well, person. See, I, I'm a little bit different. I've been run over purposely, I think, multiple times, backed up, beep, 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 boom, boom. Forward again, back up, beep, 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 boom. Seriously, legitimately, professionally. When I was young, found great superstar bands. They ran me over. I wasn't considered, seriously, legitimately. Did it matter that Alex was asleep on the floor or that Alex also too had a dream? Fuck no, because the bigger, better deal in the entertainment business, shiny object, bigger thing, wins every time. Because yeah. you remove yourself. There's only two theories 
and I'm sorry to simplify it like this, guys, that I know in art, you are an artist or you fit the suit. The problem is, is that commerce is the combination of two. Example, Bono. What the fuck happened to him? <laughs> What's your how knowledge you from Bono? For, how do you go from an absolute outside rebel to the epitome of empty vessel? Because you recognize that don't bore us, get to the chorus, doesn't allow you expression any longer. So your art became your plastic as somebody that has sold it. I'm, I've done beauty, healthcare, skincare, vitamins, chalk, cheese. Doesn't matter. There's a DNA. You replicate the DNA. For example, not trying to be political here at all whatsoever. There's an argument right now about mascots on bottles for food. I think we should have a collective argument about what is food and the coloring that makes the thing that is actually the poison, not the stupidity, again, not trying to be political, that being an idolater to a character that's a logo has anything to do with you as a human being. So once you've given that away into the concept of what you're buying, the my dream is Alex Fredericks wanted to find a band in a basement, take them all the way to the Led Zeppelin, you know, heights. My dream doesn't fit into the actual world purpose dream of the plastic CD that needed to be replicated in 400 territories. I recognized that very early, the hard way. Yeah. I lost but, my but, heart. But, but, I but, bled for it. But I want to follow that because if you think about it, like as people follow their dreams, they don't follow it often in a way that like aligns with what's required from the big beast of corporations. They follow it because they love it. So if I'm if there's a difference as the individual, though, as the individual, you can be the masterful creation every day. You can be as esoteric or as ex or existential or repetitive doesn't matter seriously but as soon as you decide i'm this this is what you are and it becomes scale and it becomes how many different pieces are there so this isn't one piece this is two pieces right i don't want to put my hands on it because but when i pull this apart there's the stem and the plastic piece where's the oh sorry three because there's a collar how fast, how big, how many? This is a blue bottle. It's a standardized bottle, but it's blue, not brown, not clear, right? So then the DNA of it, as soon as I put a stupid wrap around it and I put a brand on it, that is what it is. And for some reason, that's what most people chase. I'm a human being. I'm totally different in the fact that I'm that's where my individual yeah, but slow is. it down, <laughs> slow it down a little bit because you're Russian here. I love something. I'm actually you're... not. I'm Lithuanian. If you want to go that far back. <laughs> I'm Russian, actually. I'm Jewish. <laughs> um, we all? I'm, I'm, I'm some, you know, I'm Semitic. If we really want to go to that, nice. we can keep Beautiful. going up. <laughs> the when you're talking right now, you're talking about taking any object and giving it a personality. Because if you say it exists as it's- Can as I it's, speak first yes. person? Of course. This is why I'm here. I've smoked cannabis since I was 12. 12? 12. 12. And other than maybe collectively 15 months off in that, in that whole period of time, I can say I've smoked that whole time. The reason I'm not in the cannabis business is because THC is going to be regulated, if ever, like alcohol. So yeah. for me to be an alcohol brand, I can get one license in New York State. New York State's huge. However, Carolina's, I might have to get 17 because that's a different legislative and the way they do it is by county. It becomes very difficult. So think about THC that way. There's very little chance it's going to go straight across the board. So what you're telling me is that each state is going to regulate how THC, which is the the component within the marijuana that gets you high, they're going to regulate what it is and how it ha how it can be given to any county in, say, New York. 
Yes, but I have to split that a little bit further for you. What I'm yeah. saying is if you're talking about THC, which actually could be synthesized, that's a different conversation. That's an ingredient story. We're talking about marijuana. We're talking about a plant that grows in the ground. So I do not want to talk about FISA, big anything. That's not me. We can stay the over there. I'm in the smokable business. I like to smoke. I don't like cancer. I don't want to be poisoned. I like to smoke. So that's what my interest is. That's why I chose to do something. I have an interest. Okay. So THC as a plant, yes, is going to be regulated in my opinion. This is just an opinion. They're like assholes. We all got them. My opinion is it's going to be a very complicated business because pharma is going to step in and regulate it. I don't want to be there. Hemp is an industry. It is everything else that happens with that plant that isn't THC. Yes, I can get into the CBD THC conversation. CBD is predominant in hemp. Fantastic. But hemp is an industrial product also. Paper, hempcrete, plastic, biofuels, animal feed, rope, cordage, fi and on. With inside of that is the CBD market, which is the gold mine right now. Fantastic. Great. It's very hot. It's very flat. And it's quite fucking crowded. But it was the first gate that opened. So people flooded into there. I'm not going to sell alfalfa anymore. I'm going to grow hemp. It's a market that's doing this. It has no stabilization yet. It's like flax or chia 10 years ago. It will regulate itself. For the last eight, nine years, I have been doing product in CBD. As an ingredient, you have been able to import it as a finished oil into the United States because it's an ingredient now. It's just on a list. Okay. Okay. So I started doing formulations with a partner of mine that you might have met when you were in New York, Ellis Pacheco. And we started doing that years ago. And we had very good success using a company here in the United States. Because what a wonderful growth market. And if you are a weightlifter or a five times something something, you should probably start getting into this market. So that's what we started to do. I chose to no longer be in the New York City agency business for my own personal reasons 24 months ago. Doesn't mean that I stopped being interested in the things I'm interested in. My phone rang one day from a friend of mine that's in the physical commodities business. I trade tankers of wheat. I trade sugar commodities. But by the tanker load, meaning that's an underwritten product, it's probably been bought or sold three or four times on the water and it's in a finishing stage by the time it lands in port, what have you. He and I had done some work in the chia business we did the first M&A of a dry goods facility in the United States to process ancient grains. It was in Scaniatus, New York. It was kosher, organic, dry, blah, blah, blah. We were in the Chia market before Mama Chia or any of the companies that were out there. And we sold to a very nice, very well-respected American blue blood brand before we got to the marketplace. Because, hey, you know what? Check was bigger than the, than the problem was worth solving. We stepped out of it. Fast forward, phone rings. He says to me, hey, I have some processors that want to buy raw goods to become oil processors in CBD. Would you know where to? Of course I do, is my answer. Yes, is the answer. <laughs> okay. Yeah. We go into this and we sell a very large stack. That's fantastic. This is great. I love money. But when you start looking at it, you recognize there's a couple issues here. No problem for me. I'm not physically involved. I'm just being a connector. But I know how to make marriages. So there are babies coming out of it. And I'm being named. There are brisses. We're all celebrating. Fast forward. You get to the 2018 market where the Farm Act has opened up. There's an issue when you're a farmer. Your land is never worth your crop, 
ever. If you live in rural anywhere, what's your Zillow score? Seriously. Because if I'm just a retired fuck that wants to buy the farm next door and not raise anything, I'm buying it for pennies on the blow me. Okay? So there is a faulty model that has been pushed on the American farmer since day I don't remember when because I was probably still crapping my pants. It makes it very hard for new crops to come in on a boutique level. You need thousands of acres. The problem is with the hemp bill, everybody sold the CBD, 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 CBD world. So if I'm an alfalfa grower in wherever, I turn over some crops. I'm not an idiot. I turn over 20, 30, 100 acres. But if I'm Oregon or Colorado, I open up holy shit amount of acres. Here's an issue though. I go to the market and I take investors. What is an investor? Probably some asshole like me from New York or Colorado or LA that's like, hey, I know how to write a contract that says when you default, because you will, I own your John Deere. Because how are you actually going to take in the millions of dollars that it's going to take to turn over and aggregate and get to market? which also includes harvesting, maybe grooming, maybe finish. I don't know. But we haven't gotten there yet. So there was a model and a total tsunami coming forward. Same partner of mine said to me, hey, I got an idea. You know, there's a thing in early commodities called a forward contract, not a future. That's what you trade on the mercantile or wherever, but a forward, which means very simply, I'll bet on you, but I'm not taking your risk. So if you say average plant thousand acres per per acre, thousand thousand pounds, great, fantastic. I love you. You have a hundred acres, a hundred thousand pounds. Zygazunt, good luck. I wish you the best. I'm gonna bet on twenty percent of it. You can definitely get twenty thousand pounds. You right? Like okay, great. I'll pay ten percent down on that. It's a pretty safe bet for everybody involved. But my 10% down on that gives you your money to get started. I have a guaranteed delivery against a spec. I want it finished and dried to this, that, and a third. Great, terrific. We went to the marketplace. We raised a good amount of capital. Back to one of the pre-existing problems with CBD and hemp. Currently, it's sold on PPP, points per pound. So, therefore, if I want 10% CBD, 19% CBD, 20% CBD, you'll never get above it. You'll probably never get to there. I now have to use either the entirety of the plant, including all of the top cola and all of the value. And it really has an inflation. So, June 2018 Farmer's Bill, get to last June – you're at 345 to 365 PPE on a pound of hemp. Great. So if I want 10% hemp, there's my per pound. Simple math. That is such an inflated value, it's absurd. My partner and I are like, hey, I think that it's going to hit 89 cents. Alex, you're insane. I might be. When the yield hit, it was at like 46 cents. We saw this coming. We returned all of the capital that we had raised because it's the one place in the world I don't ever take on that liability because I have my own issues. I don't want somebody else's financials, really. And I don't want anybody coming after me because I like these. So we're like, oh, well, what do we do here? This is the whole point. I'm sorry for a very long windup. We recognize that in our network through my network of my life of saying yes to people and how can I help you? We have a farm that's a boutique farm in Vermont. It is in Bristol, Vermont, which is in the Bristol Valley, which is like the most gorgeous, picturesque Northeast, everything that you want to think about Vermont type place. It's 348 acres surrounded mountain to mountain. It's the only thing on the road that splits through. There's deer and bear and everything, the whole shit. 
And the farm's been there since 1909. Before that, it was like a trapper camp or something of that nature. And the same family's been on it since 1909, including like the, like the antique archaeology knocked over barn that has 80 years of whatever packed away into it. You know what I mean? Like falling over, like, oh my God, Alexander Hamilton's hat's in there kind of thing, you know? Um, and he, thank God to him, and thank God to us, was smart and grew top end hemp cola bud because when you look at the market he's a 40 acre operator there's no chance he's growing cbd hemp because the guy that is has a thousand acres in arizona and a million acre fucking back lot and vc money on you know, 56th Street and two Stanford MBAs and fucking vacations in Stad. You know what I mean? Like, good luck being the, I'm the farmer from Oregon or, you know, Vermont or Maine that grows actual boutique. One of the great things in this world is like, people forget like Louis Vuitton doesn't do fucking sales. Go to coach. I don't need to. However, we all want Louis Vuitton. So they they blew out their factory. There used to be a time that you couldn't. You didn't just get it. Premium was premium. Luxury actually existed. So in the hemp space, I'm sorry to get fucking way out deep. There is an opportunity that we saw, which is in the smokable market. Okay, slow down. So you've gone 30 minutes right now. Sorry. Yeah, it, no, it's great. It's like the it's the interview that <laughs> this is the biggest monologue. The we've biggest ever had. monologue we ever had. In fact, this is a precedent. But what I want to know is so just to summarize what you said, you're now selling hemp yeah. cigarettes. <laughs> joints. <laughs> would you call them joints? How would you no, phrase them? No, I don't actually know. So we have two products. One is an eighth in a jar. It's very 3.5 grams in a jar. Do, do what you want with it. The second one that we're coming out with is actually sticks. To my point, I've said this a whole bunch of times. I like to smoke. I don't want cancer or poison. I believe in delivery systems. And I actually think that the form mold model that is a cigarette is perfect. We call them sticks because I don't need any of the carcinogen. I don't need the tobacco. I don't need any of it. But to be frank with you, are you going to be a truck driver rolling down the street smoking a a cone that looks like a joint? No, because that's what it looks like. And we live in a world that perception matters almost more, which back to our pre-conversation we were having, we live in an information age. Okay, but slow down, slow down. We, I, I want to I want to reel you oh, in a little bit. Sorry. I, need a, I need a question to answer a little bit. Whew. Greenmountainsmokables.com. Greenmountainsmokables.com. So <laughs> when you put hemp, like slow us down a little bit, if I were to smoke a, what we considered a regular cigarette and a hemp cigarette, what would I notice is the difference? See, that's a tough call because tobacco, tobacco, take out the nicotine, take out the tar, take out the junk. Tobacco is a stimulant and actually quite a very nice herb. It actually is. It's also it, the nicotine and the processing of it. I, I, I'm not anti-tobacco, which is bizarre. I'm anti-junk, poison, cancer, death, big institutionalized cigarette. That's it. If you want to smoke, that's good on you. Use the best product, which is why I like hemp. Hemp will give you the CBD, which will relax you, will help you with your anxiety, which is maybe why you're leaning towards something that you physically need to be doing. And maybe that's the trap that you have in a cigarette. But would someone would someone taste the difference? That's what I still don't oh, get. Yeah, they have a different taste, of course. The, ours is gonna ours tastes like hemp, and 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 theirs tastes like tobacco that's been, well, probably most likely engineered to. Okay. to but if you were to smoke hemp, if something. you were to burn hemp, would it smell like marijuana? No, it does not. So it would it smells closer to like a pipe tobacco, to be frank with you. When dried mm. properly, there is an art to it, like anything. They, like there's a master grower versus the dude that can just put a shrub in his closet, okay? So when you, in, there's a 
the better bourbon guy than the guy that's mass producing. <laughs> so why would why would people not have already been smoking hemp for the last twenty or thirty years? Because hemp has not been illegal. So you could have. What? Oh, they have. Of course they but have. I mean, why can don't I you have a small? That's like saying to me, why don't you have a small batch anything guy? There is. There are guys make that make knives. There are guys that. You know if, I mean? if, if, I go to the, if I go to the tobaccoist right now, they don't. I assume they don't have a hemp cigarette. No, but now, you're, but now you're talking about license and distribution. Now you're back to the product side of the conversation. There's a difference between what I might be able to seek out for knowledge and do for myself, and what's readily available for me in the marketplace. Which goes back to why I say cigarettes, because for me, I'm in a product. Let's bring this back to here. Okay, I'm not trying to fucking save the world. I'm mm -hmm. trying to do my best and maybe change some things that have some sort of ripple. So I know that as a product person, I would like to be acquired in five, seven years by somebody that gives me Burt's Bees money. I believe they're owned by Clorox. I believe it was a $900 million acquisition from a little family in Maine. Not a bad day for 30 years of work. So... I want to be in the smokables business. It happens to be a category with inside of your shelf. CVS got rid of it famously a couple of years ago. Yeah. It's a shelf. It's a category. That's the world. The world is a shelf. It's why you have gurus and why you have people marketing to you. It's why Sean P. Diddy Combs has a meditation book for free on audible.com. I'll wait. You can look. The world is a shelf, and the sooner you recognize that, the sooner your discretion comes back to your pocket, which will make the difference in what you do in the life moving forward. I solve problems. The reason I got here is because I was raised in New York City. I'm totally inquisitive. I love getting in trouble because I like finding my way out of it. I don't cause harm. There's a difference between the two. I hope you go learn what they are. I am rambunctious as hell Didn't because notice. if you tell me not to open the door, that door's opening up. Okay, but slow down. Like, slow I down again. Uh, hold your horses. I'm looking at Bambos. Bambos, you, you have a question? No, I. <laughs> so, where the fuck did you find this guy, man? Exactly. But I hang up. It's like, Andy, what just happened to us? Were we just hit by a car and then he I, drove I, off? I thought he smoked before the show. <laughs> I did. Oh, yeah, see what happened? What if, it, what if he didn't smoke? What would happen then? <laughs> hey, so for me, as you speak, this, first of all, it sounds like on one level, you almost don't want anyone knowing about this because in my brain, it seems obvious that this product should have already existed on shelves in your lingo, on shelves, sure. um, say, uh, I don't know, I say 10 years ago. I like, agree with you, but I also I, know if you look at the patent office, like the telephone or the radio, there are a million patents on the same day. I spoke, it was spoken into existence. Frankly, they already exist. They're just shitty. The difference between mine and most people's is I have a partner in a farm. It's what I didn't finish there. So in my partnership, I can put out the best product handled the best way because I am not buying my input. Okay. I got it. You're 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 you're, you're doing the straight through processing. You've got where it's being done. It, it's seed to it's seed to consumer. Yeah, it's seed. To, so and, like, and and what's your? So I got your kind of dream. Help me, like walk me through in a simple way. Talk to me like I'm ten years old. Um, what happens from the point you pick the thing, you dry the thing, you've actually created the packaging, and the packaging was kind of fun and playful. What, what was the name again of the of the green, brand? Green Mountain Smokables. Green Mountain Smokables. Yeah, it just, I, I see it and I want to, I, I feel like I'm in the middle of Oregon. They're, I, they're, well, you wouldn't. You'd be in the middle of Vermont, which I hope. So <laughs> our, these are our cases. Okay. And there's our, there's some just bud in a jar. 3.5 grams in a jar. So I had the idea that hemp wouldn't look like what, what weed looks like, but it they're does look same, like weed. They're the exact same plant. It's, it's genetics. That's all. It's okay. like, it's like asparagus is a tulip, I believe, right? Like it's it, it's Alex, just Alex. genetics. A plant does this, and they just split them. Alex, green Hello. mountain smokables or green mountains? Green mountain smokables. Okay. Dot com. So Vermont is the green mountain state. Like no, you you have to do the S. You have to do the give, but with the S. Um, 
the um you so can find uh, us on instagram at gms smokes but so and how so in your lingo how do you move a product because this is interesting from a bigger a product that doesn't exist yet on the shelves how do you move the product that doesn't exist on the shelves in, onto the shelves like how do you do that that's a really great question. So our business model has pivoted in the last 90 days. The first way that we were going to do this business was a very physical retail business that may Hashem let me get back to, seriously. And the way that you do that is you identify people that are already authorities in the field like you would do for anything. Anything, anything. And you yeah. start having conversations with them before you try to influence them and you find out how they operate their thing and you ask if you may suggest to them something. So the way I started for this, I found what are called rack jobbers. They are people that have routes that are own their routes in neighborhoods. Maybe they work for Pepsi or Gallo Wine or Frito-Lay or whatever milk company and they have 30 stores that they go to. There is a possibility that if as a freelancer, they could carry not inventory, very important, but sample. I'm happy to fulfill for anybody that wants to drop a sample someplace. I'll do the sale and pay out the commission to the guy that opened it up. That's just understanding a business model of whom I'm speaking to as the authority in the space. So if I'm going into eventing or if I'm going... Yeah, okay, so let's slow down because you always you always condense. You're such a dense talker. Like you say 20 things in one sentence and any one of them is really a, a whole topic for a show. So what I find incredibly, uh, like the way your brain works, it, it works that way you just take it for granted, is you're always thinking about how do I get this into the market and you're laterally working through the problem solving. You don't do the obvious thing like, oh, let me go to each store. You say... I need to find the transporter who brings these so that they can come in as samples. And through that, they'll fall in love with the product and then I'll get my distribution. Yes, but that's because the first job I ever got to give a middle finger to my father was selling knockoff perfumes. And the opportunity in that was like $7 per perfume. And I was like, God damn, there's no way I'm going to walk up to 100 people. You know what I did? What'd you do? I went to his mother, who was living in an old age home at the time, and I had her sell it straight through. I had the number one sales record of the place ever. I quit the next day. You want to know why? You're thinking about distribution all the I'm time. I'm just trying to figure out the easiest, most direct. My yeah. number one skill that I've ever sold to clients, you can ask anybody that's ever worked for me. I can get to anybody in the world. Doesn't mean I know them. I yeah. can just figure out who they are and work backwards too. And it's always surround strategy. It's never direct. I do Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. I like to fight. It's a lot of fun. Anytime one-on-one -on -one is great, but that's not the world. The world is influence and surround strategy. And if you can get the person to think of it and, and call you, if so I how call you, so how I do you, what you offer. You call how me. How do you work with yeah. someone? How do you work with someone and not overwhelm them with, uh, with you? Because as I said to you guys before this, this is Alex Fredericks. You asked me to show up. Okay. This is not me in the world. Oh, wow. Me in the world is a professional. I was raised. I have manners. I shut the fuck up and I listen. I ask uh, questions. You asked to interview me. I took <laughs> off my trousers, so to speak, and I just nice. let it unfurl. I love it. That might be one of the problems in the world today is that we have forgotten how to censor ourselves I yeah. think a lot of crazy shit, you must imagine. Does it all come out? Sometimes my wife is like, why did you say that? And I say, because it's just rattling around my head. And if I don't get it out, it will bother me. I'm totally, <laughs> I'm totally serious. Because honey, when I'm honey, actually in the honey world, have you thought about going on a diet? Oh, I just said that. <laughs> <laughs> See? Oh, Jesus. I always have a song in my head to back up so that I can shut myself up. Okay. So I know. When I deal with clients, I actually love, as this started out, I just want to solve problems. So I need to listen to hear what yours are. That's yeah, exactly. that's not any, any good sales, obviously. So yeah. when you, so you have, you, you have the product uh, being, being grown. You so, have, you have the uh, packaging, you, the market, you, you have the production of getting them into the packaging as well. And yes. now, and now it's just a question of how do you transition 
from a product into a distribution channel where this actually has sales, points so of let sale. Me, let me back that up one step. So we have two products. The the bud in the jar that I showed you, yeah. yeah, we packed in-house because I can figure that out labor cost. Yes. The other side of it, though, to be honest with you, I don't want to reinvent the wheel. So our sticks, I co-packed with somebody. Okay. I just spent a couple months worth of research, having real conversations with people about their capacity, their capability. Yeah. I want to use my product against your machines. How does that work? Who's the, what's your certifications? I don't know what questions to ask. Might you be able to point me to some uh, uh, somebody else that you've already worked with so I can ask them what you did wrong? You yeah. know, hire a contractor type stuff. What's your, yeah. those type things actually matter in a business because I'll solve my production cost when I have money. Right yeah. now I need to get to the market. Sure. So therefore go to the authority again, find the authority. Yeah, and you're and so you basically you figured out how to get production without having to pay and create production facilities yourself. By the way, oh. you fr you froze a second and you're back now. So you figured out how to do that. Yes, I stopped. I stopped and I did research. Yeah. Okay. And now at this very point, now this is where I think the magic of life comes in and where people stop or they don't get the uh, the jolt they need of creativity. And, and, I, and I think, and this is what I find is that people often so associate creativity with like, for instance, the packaging. They'll say, wow, that packaging is really creative. It's really marketed well. But I see as much, if not more creativity in how you define a go-to-market strategy. And, and what I'm, I'm, I'm really curious, of course, you said, uh, yes, you've actually done this other, trying to find uh, people that are already distributing and, and sort of hijack them through samples. What other ways do you see yourself getting into the market? I'd like to say first, I spent $50 on Fiverr to do our logo. I spent, no. I, I spent $200 on Fiverr to do our labeling. No. Yes. I spent $1,500 on Fiverr to do our website. I'm totally serious. Do you want to know why? I went in with an RFP. I took the time to think about it, to yes. talk to other people, to ask questions, to actually read case yeah. studies, to do the things. I was on page 17. Ugh. Why? Because that's the guy that's not really advertising. Maybe he's doing work. Maybe I can have a conversation yeah. with him. I can refer you three other things if you can do this for. Yeah, we that's... work very. We work very similarly. Okay. I don't so actually work. blame someone that does bad work because I always feel like I didn't give them a good briefing. And if I didn't give them a good briefing, I would have been able to have gotten what I wanted. I also know that until I spend thousands of dollars, you're using a font out of a box. Let's not lie to each other. Okay, so. That's creative as well as what it looks like creative. So how I'm finding customers, again, I do Brazilian jiu-jitsu. We're all in pain. I know we all smoke weed. Why don't you smoke a little less weed, get some more CBD? I'm talking to people like that. My, our, I can't why, Hold out. on. Why, why wouldn't you transition people and say, listen, stop smoking cigarettes. Start because that's, smoking. Edu that's education and marketing. The marketing has a cost. Connecting to consumers has your passion and you have to maximize your passion before you start spending against your cost in my space. And I'll tell you why I'm selling a product that I can't actually sell. I can't run an Instagram ad right now that says smoke CBD, click link, go here. Can't do it. Why not? not? I'm not allowed. Because. because because the world's stupid run by idiots that want to be in control of how I shit. I don't know because I'm it's not, not FDA lawyer. approved. It has nothing to do with FDA. It has to do with Facebook and what Facebook allows and what Google allows and the keywords that you use and what you're buying against. So I can't click through and just sell a product like I'm selling. I have all fucking paraphernalia in front of me. Coffee cups on fucking Etsy. Yeah, I, I literally everything I just went to reach for was like some other shit I don't want to put on camera. <laughs> <laughs> but the but the point in that i have to be creative so the way that i've been creative is the same thing this right here i'm not trying to give away my secrets i don't really care it's an open kimono world okay this is a case of 10 yeah these are ten dollars a piece 
Okay. Wholesale retail on my website, they are $20 a piece. Okay. If you want to buy them and sell them, the difference is a $10 commission to person. Okay. Or I promise you sitting on a retail shelf for $25. That's actually how the world works. It's lemonade stands, people. It's nothing more than that. Because the 500 cases that we made in our bathtub, not being serious, right, are actually, if I can't do that myself, you don't want to be in business. Yeah, that but so, so you basically, like you just gave the model pretty simple. I sell each piece at 10 bucks. Uh, if you want to try to sell it and do it as a sort of in your network, sell it for 20. If you want to stock it on a shelf, it's 25. I mean, that's really your business. In, Find that, your, in that particular item, yes. I'm not in that particular my item. For my other ones. But yes, because but that's anything that you should be doing. I have a client that's in the COVID space right now. They're selling egress management systems. It's a a tablet takes your temperature, sees if you're wearing a mask. Yes, fine. Boop, door opens, they go in. I promise you they're doubling up from what they're getting to what the next person is and down the line. They're not passionate about it. It's a business. Sure. So if it's a business that you're passionate about, hello, make sure you build in your market and do it your margin and do it yourself. There's the there's no other but you still need to get the distribution, and that's where the creativity comes in. Yes, but distribution comes when you have something to offer somebody past yes. product. I'm going to the music business. I started with a band. When they were in the basement, it was their friends, their mothers, their best friends. Yay! You have to get all of those people out of the room and get real people in the room. And then get those people to walk out of the room having a great experience, very important, telling their friends to come back. I started when I had to make the postcard. So first we had to design the stupid calendar and Xerox front and back. It was shit to do. Yeah. So then you had to have value in your effort. One of the problems right now, it's all out of the box. So everybody wants instant return. They really think that they can just be... Um, uh, you know, some straight, you know, straight sell through product. It doesn't actually work that way, people. What really works is understanding your audience. I can speak about hemp for the next five hours. Really, I can get all the way down into why and what and how and the better grinder to use because I think that that wider teeth is more important than thinner teeth because uh -huh. hemp is very gummy. So frankly, if you want to smoke it properly, you want to make sure that it's aerated and not really small because it will then become a split. I actually am passionate about something. So then figuring out the whys, how yeah. do I get to, it's the same thing. Like, again, I started with a band in a basement to get them signed to whatever. Columbia so just, Richards. just to slow you down again. So I, I kind of love it because what you're, what you kind of are going back to over and over and over again is you're talking about a state of mind and you're saying in that state of mind, it happens because I don't know what the next opportunity is going to be. I just know when it shows up, I'll know how to deal with it. And I'm fishing. Ronnie always says to me, cause I'm always looking for new guests on the show. So um, on an evening, I'll watch a TED talk or I'll see a, a, a well-known person and I'll just say, oh, interesting. I'd love to, I'd love to do it with them. And she says, you're chumming, you know, I'm just chumming the waters. And so in, in some ways, it's very similar to how you're going through life in some ways is that, is that you're, you have an intention, which is what I hear. And in that intention, you begin to say there's things that emerge, but they don't emerge if you're not in the right state of mind going in a direction. I started this by saying the answer is yes. So what's the question? Yeah. And I have to back that up by understanding the most powerful word is no. And I'm willing to use the word no. I'm also willing to show you the fucking door. Yeah. And that's, and that's another thing. And we talk about that clearly on this show a lot, as we say, basically, if you're really comfortable in your no, you can go really far out. You can invite yeah. everyone to come in yeah. because at the, at the end of the day, okay. As long as you have the no, you won't get stuck. For whatever this means to anybody possibly watching this, I grew up in an era that Wednesday night at the limelight on the top floor where there were weird saunas happening behind me and I was very much underage. I didn't care. It wasn't me. It doesn't bother me. What do I care? And frankly, I know where the door is myself. 
I know how I walked in there. I know I can walk out of there. Do and- you feel comfortable saying no? So you can go into the limelight because you're not really all that worried because what's I, going on. Because I'm actually looking for the yes. And if you're looking for the yes, no is actually reactionary. So you, what was the yes you were looking for at the limelight? Oh, experiential. I didn't want to be fucking home. I was a oh, okay. fucking 14-year-old kid. Do you want to be sitting in your house on the Upper West Side or be like, hey, what's out in the world? Yeah, <laughs> I want to be out it. in the world. It's the actual reason I am what I am. I'm looking for the next problem to solve because it puts you someplace. I know some really interesting people by also saying, hey, man, could you? Yeah, of course I can do that. But you don't. It doesn't matter. Yeah. What matters is I believe I'm going to do it. And I'm also comfortable to say somebody I can't do that or that's not for me. Like we did earlier. You said, hey, would you list the people? No, I won't because I was actually paid for discretion. And that mm-hmm. means something to me. It might not mean something to other people. Not my problem. I'm my yeah. problem. <laughs> and I, yeah, but it I guess my own. It, it goes to, you know, it's always funny because with your energy, right? There's two things. No one's going to be able to mimic you because you are you. But to some degree, the state of mind you're in when you're creating is something that if one understands what that feels like, there's uh, there's incredible power and potential in it. And I know it of myself because I'll show up very similarly as I hear you showing up. But when I show up, I almost uh, I'm almost so subdued in my energy that I'm welcoming the yes in. Like I'll I'll, I'll go to you know I went to the gay bars when I was in when I was uh, uh, in high school, right? Because I worked, I sold suits. 16, I was the only straight kid in the suit place. So all the gay guys said, Andy, you got to come out with us, right? I had no issue going in there. I thought it was great fun. And, and and of course, when they picked up on me, I was like flattered, like, yeah, isn't that nice? And I always knew that I could say no. So there was no fear or anxiety because it was like, I, I'm comfortable there. And I, and I see that energy is something really that transcends because if you're if you're fearful of having to say no and you don't want to say no that means you don't even go out into the world and experience whatever you can experience one of one of the things that like one of the problems with the trite culture of instant celebrity is that people don't actually understand their value and their value is your value is in your your own self so like the, the lifetime journey of knowing yourself is not the moments that you're living with inside of it. And what I mean by that, for me, very simply as, a, as, as like somebody that grew up, I was there for the experience, like legitimately for yeah. the experience. I was in house clubs when I was 14 years of age because I'm a music, excuse the word, retard. I'm dyslexic as fuck fuck and i repeated the third grade and i never wanted to be left back ever again and i'm the youngest kid in my family that words are very important my father's a litigation attorney so the only way that i could keep up seriously was music and pop culture because it taught me how to speak because i couldn't actually read until i was in sixth grade and i Mm -hmm. did not want to be fucking left behind i had to start paying attention the thing about paying attention is if that you then turn on your curiosity because people oh how did you learn that word or where'd you get more I can actually talk about varying things because I grew up in a time, thank God, where there were interesting people. And yes, there was danger and seediness. And if you didn't know how to handle yourself, you could really go down the wrong path. But the converse of that was, if you do know how to handle yourself, you go around times and interesting folks that aren't going to be reproduced because we're so homogenized and so instantaneous. I had a funny repartee with my wife last night i do a really stupid thing when somebody says something a song lyric comes out of my head i can't fucking help it and i did some song from like 1983 that she had never heard of and i said ha 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 you never heard of it and i went to google and i said the lyrics into the phone it played the thing she said to me what would you have done had you not had google i said that's funny i would have called my sister amanda and i would have done the exact same thing And if she had not known it, when we both hung up the phone, it was a race to see who got the answer. That Mm -hmm. used to be the fucking world. I used to tour with a map and a roll of quarters. You know what I mean? Like you used to go out and have an adventure. My brain works that way. So for a client, for a product, I want to see it on the shelf. How does it get there? I don't know. Let's work backwards. Well, I saw the guy walk in and he had a truck. 
and he took shit off the truck, and there was a number on the side. Excuse me, what do you guys do? Oh, you sell product? Could I come in and talk to you about my product? Yeah, Tuesdays at 3 is when we do that. Excuse me, I've never done this before. Could you recommend what I should bring? <laughs> oh, thank you. And what was your name? Sal? Oh, thank you. And when you show up, Sally, I remembered your name. I heard that you like donuts. Here's the donut. Like writing the fucking thank you card for the present. It's the same shit, but we've obfuscated ourselves somehow. Like we've, co- which is why I'm saying here, like, yeah, this is Alex Fredericks. This actually is me. I'm happy to just, yes, because in the world, I too could put on my stupid little suit and I go and play the part. I get it. Totally get it. But that's not product. Product has to be connective. So you have to start with your audience. What, Like, yeah. if you're a cover band, you're playing weddings. Yeah. It's the way it goes. That's your audience. The person that wants to hear yes. the music that already exists. But if you're an artist, you figure out and then you go, shit. Well, you never are the person selling it. It's the person that comes in. I did that forever. Forever for people. So I can do it naturally, maybe. But I think it's anybody's inquisitive nature of being like, I'm here. How do I get there? I want to know those people. How do you walk up to somebody in a bar? Well, I don't know today. But, you know, how do you? Well, I didn't have to date online. I didn't have to swipe left. <laughs> Shit, man. If somebody was like looking at me, I was getting no dates. I had to, <laughs> I had to have a personality, funny uh, enough. Uh, well, I, I think you got your photogenic. You got yeah, he's got, I think you shaved down a bit. I used you know? to have very thick black hair. I did all right for myself. I'm not going to lie. But the reality <laughs> of it, it's actually because I had a personality that matched. I'd like yes. to think. Alex, yes. it is. We are one minute yeah, over. What do you mean you know? Anytime somebody uses my name, it, it goes with shut up. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? If, if it was that, I would have said Alexander. <laughs> Then you have to say Benjamin, Alexander Benjamin. You're like, oh. yeah, I was Andrew, Andrew Raymond, right. Andrew Raymond. Thank you for being with us. It okay, was guys. very cool. Uh, I'm happy we didn't prepare any questions for him. <laughs> here's, here's the thing. That's how you would have gotten the most succinct version of me. No, I, I really got the, I really actually, I, I, I had to turn off my brain and sort of allow you, it, allow you to immerse in me. Like I had to like allow it all to come in because there was so much information that I really had to. Uh, um, and we have Bola Long and he's our basically our best critic. And he says the world is full of interesting people. So you've got his seal of approval. Oh, good, good. <laughs> and th- thanks for letting me uh, vomit on your... Uh... It was great. Thank you very <laughs> much, man. Love very you. Nice to Alex. Appreciate Talk it, John. Have a great Bye. one. You too, man. That was fun. Yeah. <sighs> He reminds me of Ron Vargas, of course, yes. right? He has this very similar Ron Vargas vibe. Yes. And they both had weed while they were on the show. That's a a, a second. Uh, and when they talk, they really emphasize yeah. the words that they're speaking. <laughs> yeah. Very passionate. <laughs> you're almost like, well, you don't even want to interrupt, do you? Because you're like, they're so passionate. I feel like it's an insult. <laughs> if, I, if I cut in, basically, I'm like, I'm, I'm like, they lose. It's almost like an actor or an actress in the middle of a scene. Like the scene has to play out, right? I, I like your summaries, though. Yeah, I try to, I try to pull in because he was saying things. He said so much that sometimes my brain couldn't grasp everything, and then you would come in and summarize part of it. And like, oh, okay. yeah, because I saw like there's things about how that mind works, which is exactly call it the paradigm how I work from. So I recognize a lot of myself in him, although how I do it is a little bit more a slow, a slower pace. Yeah. So when he talks about like I'm always, when he talked about how to make business, he's, what all he's saying is, is that he doesn't look in any land of what's not possible, which I never look in. I just say, what exists? And then as he said, the car drives, there's a number, I call the phone number. And then, I mean, I do that all the time. A friend of mine, I think I told you, Jeff Lieberman, he has an incredible product. Um, he's, I said, listen, do me a favor, send me the product. I got mm. on the moped and I went to 10 shops and just said, this is the best thing you're ever going to see. Yeah, yeah. And and they didn't believe me, right? Of course, everyone says, oh, yeah, come on. But I was forceful enough that they said, okay, let's have a look. And then they would be shocked because it was that good. 
They said, and and I sold, I think, a hundred units. Imagine that. hundred. You sold a hundred. Yes. The, the, like the one you have downstairs. Yeah, of nice, course. I just nice. went, but I mean, I didn't get a commission. I didn't. I just thought, you know what? This is an incredible product. Uh, it doesn't have the distribution. If people just saw it existed, they'd buy it. If you haven't seen it, then I strongly suggest you go to to check it out. It's a uh, it's uh, wondermachines.com, wondermachines.com, and it's called Slow Dance. It's an incredible product. Um, he's an engineer, and he basically found a frame, and he used a special technique so that anything you place in the frame, it gets life. It looks as if it's moving in slow motion. So you, your eyes, it's three-dimensional in front of you, but you're looking at a, a something moving in slow motion. So it's mixture of vibration and flickering light. So your eyes cannot quite make sense of what it sees. This is incredible. So that's what I see in him is this pulsating, how, what's there, what's there. There's no, there's never a, what's not possible. It's just, how do I move? How do I move? And of course I see it as well in you when you're working through problems and when there's more scarcity, as we discussed that it's harder to live with that creativity because you're trying, you're, you're, you're reactive as opposed to creative and expansive and yeah. that sort of thing. So that was great to have him on just to sort of see how that mind works. Next time I, I have another <laughs> guest re, that I have on that I believe is quite similar. And for that, we're going to have a, a green card and a red card. <laughs> so, so I didn't think we would need it for the show. Cause I thought we'd break in more, but I'm going to start, I'm going to start using those cards. Maybe we'll just keep them here. Yeah. If you find a green and red card, just buy them and then we'll have them just to Great. make sure. Because some guests just go so fast. We got to like, and you know. I think it's the first time this has really happened. It is long. the first time. Yeah. We went 30 minutes. We didn't actually ask a question for 30 minutes, <laughs> which I still loved. It was fantastic. Well, but you, We didn't ask questions. I, how I, could we? It was just, <laughs> he was there full on. It was just, we were long for the ride. It's almost like the, the, the horse left the stable. Now we're just holding on for dear life. Oh, great. So we uh, we have tomorrow's show, right? Tomorrow's show. Oh, tomorrow's show. We actually have Eric Shiner on. I told told you Eric is, he's the director of Pioneer Works. And if you haven't seen Pioneer Works, we're not necessarily going to discuss that together with him, but Pioneer Works is an incredible location. It's a loft building in New York. It's out just outside of New York where they have basically said, we're going to merge art and science together in a facility and it's uh, the brainchild of Dustin Yellen. Dustin Yellen is a really well-known artist today. You might have seen his work, life-size plastic. It's a you'll see glasses of plastic that are put onto each other that are to life, and it's a human body that's made with little small images. And then each body it looks as if you if you could walk around it, you'll look at it in three dimensions, and it'll all be made of just intric just little pieces of thread or a little dot or, but not a human body, but it'll appear as a human body, which wow. is just incredible. And um, yeah, so he's gonna be on the show. We're gonna discuss living between the Eastern and Western philosophies, because he's lived in, the, in Japan many years, as I have. And I just wanted him on the show because he's managing businesses in the US after having lived in Japan. And for me, there's such a different way of seeing the world and managing and working. I wanted to spend an hour. We never discussed it. I said, can, we do, can, we, can I have you on air so we can discuss it? What does it feel like to know the Japanese sensibility and also to see that it doesn't necessarily work in the Western and vice versa? So I, I'm inviting him on to have that discussion tomorrow. And that's it. We're good? Yeah, I think <laughs> so. I feel like we can start the next show now. <laughs> Have a beautiful evening, guys. Thank you. Bye. Bye.